You guys remember back before I started reading Malazan and I had that bit in the why I decided to read where I said, uh, I'm having a hard time finding anyone who can describe to me what this series is about. Now I get it. I definitely think I get it. Every decision you make can change the world. The best life is the one the gods don't notice. If you want to live free, live quietly. Now these ashes have grown cold, we open the old book. These oil-stained pages recount the tales of the fallen, a frayed empire, words without warmth. The hearth is ebb, its gleam and life sparks are but memories against dimming eyes. And what cast my mind, what hew my thoughts as I open the Book of the Fallen and breathe deep the scent of history? Listen, then, to these words carried on that breath. For these tales are the tales of us all, again, yet again. We are a history relived, and that is all. Without end, that is all. Power ever draws other power. You can shake your fist all that you want. But dead is dead. Hey, what's up, bookworms and bridge burners? We are back again to talk Malazan, and we're starting today with the 1999 debut novel by Steven Erickson. Of course, this is Gardens of the Moon. I'm going to go ahead and call myself Alamander Mike right now because I think that's just a clever nickname, right? Uh, not really, but uh, I saw someone on the uh, Discord had Alamancer Rake, and I thought that was just superb, so I'm kind of stealing it a little bit here. But yes, guys, the, uh, the kickoff of Malazan is underway. We have started book one out of ten through the read-along here, and uh, I'm excited to talk about it. This will be a non-spoiler review. If you want spoilers, say this the first time you found the channel, guys. I have done two videos right here uh, over almost an hour uh, talking about spoilers for this book. So if you're looking for uh, something to unpack, that would be the one to watch. This is really uh, people who are still kind of on edge about if they want to read this book or not. And I'm here to tell you why I think maybe you probably should or, or should not. We're going to talk about it. But uh, yeah, this is uh, let's get a little background here. This is based off of uh, Stephen Erickson and Ian C. Elselmont's Dungeons and Dragons game that they were playing in the early 80s. And it's uh, something that they kind of devise into a movie script that actually went and they pitched that movie script at one point. Uh, if you read a little further into it, you see that they had a lot of uh, people that were interested, but they were saying, okay, but you got to take this out, this out, this out, this out, because it's going to be too expensive. Now that I've read this book, I see why studios thought, yeah, that's going to be too expensive to make because guys, I got through chapter two of this book and I was like, We'll never see this on the big screen. There's no way. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's something that they decided then they were going to go ahead and you know, kind of transcribe into a novel. And that started in the early 90s. It finally got published in 1999. A long process, but it was worth it apparently because I think what I understand that Bantam UK gave Stephen Erickson one of the biggest uh, settlements ever for a, a not written yet fantasy series. So he made the deal for 10 books. And uh, yeah, he uh, not only did he pull it off, apparently he pulled it off quite well. And it began in 1999 with Gardens of the Moon. Uh, like you, like I said, guys, we're doing a channel read-along for this right now. In case you don't know, if you're the last person out there watching the channel who don't know, we are doing a channel read-along for this. In January was Guardians of the Moon. Over February and March, we'll be doing Book 2, Dead House Gate. So if you haven't started yet, there's still time for you to catch up. So uh, I think that most people, uh, there's still a couple people that are still straggling a little bit behind that are, that are going to make it before the, uh, February begins. But uh, just uh, jump on the Discord if you want, and uh, that is how the read-along is going to work. Now let's go ahead and talk about the book. And we're going to begin, like we always do, by doing what is it about? And I'll just say, good question. Good, good question. Now, I actually uh, went ahead and I looked up the uh, the Goodreads summary, and it was pretty good. So I'm going to kind of steal that from them here. The Malazan Empire simmers with discontent. 
bled dry by warfare, bitter infighting, and bloody confrontations with the formidable Animator Rake and his Tiss Andy, ancient and implacable sorcerers. Even the Imperial Legion yearns for some respite, yet Empress Lassine's rule remains absolute, enforced by her Dread Claw assassins. For Sergeant Whiskey Jack and his squad of bridge burners, and for Tattersail, surviving Cadre Mage of the 2nd Legion, the aftermath of the Siege of Pale should have been a time to mourn the many dead. But Darugistan, last of the free cities of Genobacus, yet holds out. It is to this ancient citadel that Lassine turns her predatory gaze. However, it would appear that the Empire is not alone in this great game. Sinister, shadowbound forces are gathering, and the gods themselves prepare to play their hand. And play their hand they do, because guys, there's this thing called Deck of Dragons. And you'll see. You'll see. Okay, guys, let's just go ahead and dive right into what makes it bad. I like to start with the good here, because I found mostly good things about this book. I'll go ahead and say right up front, I enjoyed the book quite a bit. If you watch those spoiler talks, you know that's because I approached it with that method of I'm not going to understand everything in a book one out of a book t of a ten book series. I, I get that, and I think that helped me quite a bit. But uh, I got to say, this is the most unique and fresh fantasy that I have read in decades. I cannot think of anything else that is similar to this. Nothing. Maybe Dune. I'll get into that in a little bit here. But here's the deal. So many of these popular fantasy series that people want me to read, and then I'll read them, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, this is just like this, or it's not kind of like this, or it's kind of derivative of that. This is completely original, and Erickson doesn't do... He doesn't derivative of anyone else's work. He just goes for it right away, and that is absolutely welcomed by me. I needed that. I needed something that didn't feel like a rehash of something I'd already read before or their spin on the same story that someone else used. I can't think of anything else even close to similar to how this book is. And that is a great thing. Great thing. Not derivative at all. That was very important to me. But the mix of world building and just the scope of this world. We spend all this book on one continent, on Genobacchus. But yet the whole time you're hearing about all these other places. And it just already feels like this world is massive. And we've only been to really... You know, two locations really here. And it's just it's just so, so big. And the magic system, wow. Uh, I don't think any of you are one of those people who are like, oh, I love Brandon Sanderson because I love the way he describes his magic system. You ain't going to get that here, guys. Uh, it, because uh, I don't, I'm not even convinced that the characters understand how Warrens work at this point. But uh, yeah, it's a it's a deep magic system that isn't explained fully. And you just kind of get some, some ideas here. But uh, I want to talk about the character development here. One of the criticisms that I heard before I started this book was, well, Erickson's strong point isn't developing his characters. Uh, so far he is, because look, this book throws a lot of characters. I mean, a lot, like 60 maybe, if I'm just guessing. Uh, thank God there's a glossary if you need to refer back to any of them. But he does such a great job at differentiating every single one of these characters to where I never like getting two characters confused. You know, I mean, even on the bridge burners, there's two guys who have like the same job, which is called a sapper. And I never have a hard time differentiating which one is which. I think that that is a magnificent job for a novel this size from a first time author. Because uh, a lot of these characters could have just been, you know, blank avatars that you could have just been like, okay, whatever. I was actually guilty of it once. There's a character that I thought was just going to be like a drunk write-off character. And he ends up having a huge role in this book. And that showed me right away, I don't think there are any throwaway characters in this. And me, being a character first guy, I absolutely love that. Some spectacular character development for many, many characters in this. And um, I'll just say right away, guys, I can tell why people have said, don't get too attached to anybody because uh, there's already been some quick exits for some characters. But I love all the different cultures and races and society. I want to know more about the Tistandi. I love the whole the little bits that we've got about the Talani Moss. It's just so much. And you can just feel this is just the beginning of something massive and something great. And I haven't even heard of, you know, 10% of this world at this point. So I I, I, just, I can't wait to see what comes next. Uh, another thing I think is kind of underrated and here's the humor. Uh, I won't say it's quite like Joe Abercrombie, but Joe Abercrombie has that way of putting that dark humor in a story that's very bleak. Uh, I think this is kind of a cruel and unforgiving world. I won't go quite as far as to say it's grimdark 
or something like that. But uh, it's it's very very bleak in a way that you know you can feel hopeless at times. I mean, obviously you're in the middle of a war here, but uh, the the humor that happens when it happens, it actually lands quite well. Most of it comes from uh, Onos Tulan, which is uh, probably my favorite character in this book. Uh, I thought I found his humor. I thought he was just going to be a I don't want to give too much about the race away because it's such a cool, cool species. But uh, it, it's uh, he just has such a dry humor that I wasn't expecting. And every time he makes a joke, I'm laughing while the character he's with is just like groaning and rolling her eyes. I love it. I love the humor in here. It's just so well-timed, never overdone. It never takes away from the stakes of what happened. There's a lot of stakes in most of this book. But when that humor does hit, it lands every time. So I hope that that keeps up through this series because I think uh, when you got a world that's just punishing, you could use a little levity now and again. Another thing, a criticism I heard was that action wasn't his best point. Again, I got to wonder if you guys are reading the same book that I read. There's a, a duel between two assassins here that is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, uh, someone told me, I think I was on Philip Chase's channel recently, and someone said that he is actually, Stephen Ekstrom was a fencer. So he knows how to walk you through a sword fight. And I get a lot of shit from this from Wheel of Time fans. One thing I don't like in my sword fights is I don't like made up sword forms or use your imagination. No, describe what's happening to me with a sword fight. Sebastian de Castell, beast at this. He would show me step by step what's happening in the sword fight, and you could see it like a cinematic in your head. Same with this. Very, very good sword fighting and the action scenes. There is a battle in chapter two that is what most books, if they're a trilogy, it's the last battle in their book. And this happens in chapter two. And it's just incredible. It really just set the tone for me right away. I was like, the prologue, it's pretty good. Uh, chapter one, yeah, this is decent. And then chapter two, I was like, wow, this is amazing. I'm reading something special. That's really how this book grabbed me right away. I never felt sloggy with this book at all. I Again, I went into it knowing that there was things I was not going to understand, and I've been fine. I rolled with it. If you watch those spoiler talks, I think I said the word I don't know about 437 times. So it, it, it's clearly not everything that uh, that you're going to want in something if you're one of those people who needs a beginning, middle, and end in every single book in your series. But for me, hook. I am hooked on a lot of these questions. I got so many questions about the Tistandi. I got so many questions about the Talani Moss and, the, and, their, and, their, and their battle with the, with the Jagood. I, I want to know what the Panion Damin is. I want to know more about the Ascendants. I want to know the difference between them and Elder Gods. I want to know what's going on with these seven cities. I mean, there's so many questions I already have, you know, so uh, there's a lot more. Like I said, hit the spoiler talk if you want to know more of what I want to know about. But again, I think if you're going into it, knowing you're not going to understand everything, you're going to probably like what you find. Uh, here's the bad stuff. And again, I think this is going to be subjective because I didn't have a ton of problems with this. Uh, first up is going to be the structure. If you're the type who reads traditional fantasy and you need your clear-cut protagonist and antagonist, you're not getting it here. Because right away you're like, oh, okay, I see. These are going to be the good guys. And then you realize, oh, but they're kind of working for these this this bad empire that's you know trying to take over these free nations. That's uh, So then you realize, okay, well, maybe sometimes good people work for bad companies, right? I mean, it happens. So I, it's, it's kind of that Abercrombie way where there is no clear-cut good guy or bad guy, and no one thinks that they're the villain in the story, for sure. So uh, if you're someone who needs that protagonist and that antagonist, it might be a little jarring to you at first. Uh, you're not going to have your traditional farm boy leaves home kind of thing here. Nothing like that. I can't think of any fantasy tropes that I read this and I was like, oh, I saw that coming. I don't think I saw anything in this book coming. It kept me guessing the entire time. But some people might, might consider it not being a traditional fantasy style. It's going to be kind of tough. A big one that I had was that the narrative shifts so much. Uh, he switches POV characters so much without any warning. It's literally, you just go to the next paragraph and you're reading someone else. You're like, wait, what happened? I thought I was reading this character. Now it's this character. That happens a lot. And you will find yourself being like, wait, 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 wait. I have to go back because I didn't know that we had changed characters. Uh, I've been told that's something he improves down the line. I don't care about shifting focus. I just I just wish that there was like a page break or something to let me know. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, it's something that I, I got used to because look, guys, this is my first reading. A book of the Fallen, I already feel like I'm doing my reread because I would finish a paragraph and I would reread it because I'd be like, wait, I, I must have missed that. I don't, I don't understand what happened there, right? So, um, yeah, you don't get very many answers. That's the big one here. Uh, if you're reading this book wanting to know things, you're not going to know. And from what I understand, you're not going to know a lot of them until at the minimum book three and most likely book 10. So there's going to be questions that go arcs that go this entire series. You're just going to have to commit if you want to commit to it. I'm all in, you know, so I'm fine with that. But uh, 
that might bug some people uh, because like I said, even your long running series, you always felt like at least it could be kind of a closed ended book, each one. Not with this one, man. This really is just the beginning. This feels almost like a prologue to something bigger. So uh, if you're looking for that, uh, for those answers, you might be a little disappointed. Let me get into why you should read it. Say you're suffering from traditional fantasy burnout. You want something new and fresh, as I put it. This is going to give you what you're looking for. However, if you haven't read very much fantasy, I absolutely would not recommend starting with this. I've had lots of people, oh, all I've read is, you know, horror and, and nonfiction. Could I jump into this? That's like trying to uh, play Advanced Dungeons and Dragons without even playing Monopoly first. I, I think that you would just be way in over your head. You're going to be like, what is going on? I don't understand any of this at all. But if you've read something like A Wheel of Time or, or a Stormlight Archive, I think you'll be fine. You're, you're going to jump right in. As long as, again, you go with those expectations, if you're not going to get all your answers right away, then you're going to be fine. You're going to enjoy it. I did. Uh, but again, there's tons of stuff. Uh, that I didn't get at all. If you're in a military fantasy, I think this is going to be right in your wheelhouse. I haven't run a ton of military fantasy. I think Joe Abercrombie might be the most I've read, but uh, yeah, this I think this will be exactly what you're looking for. It, uh, if you like the heroes by Joe Abercrombie, I think you'll like a lot of the bridge burner stuff in here. Very good stuff. Uh, I love the bridge burners already. Uh, I love a lot of the Phoenix Inn characters, and that, and that's the kind of the thing where you're you're that kind of song of ice and fire thing. We're like, oh, well, I love these characters, but they want to fight these characters who I also love. You know, it's it, it's a thing where you're like, no, no, yes, no, no, yes. Yeah. So uh, it's good. That means that he's writing some very good characters. But again, guys, I don't think you should start your journey here if you haven't. Um, think about a couple of final thoughts here. This was sold to me as the worst book in the series. And if that's true, I am buckling up for what is going to be one of the best series I've ever read. Because if this is the worst that the man has to offer, I can't wait to see what comes next. This is the quickest that I have fell into the lore and the history of a fantasy world. Probably the quickest in Stormlight Archive. Because, I, again, I don't want to sound like I'm picking on Wheel of Time. But a lot of people say, well, what about Wheel of Time? I was like, when I read Wheel of Time, you read Eye of the World, and you're kind of like, huh, that sounds really familiar to something else I read by some dude named Tolkien. That never happens with this. I never felt like this was similar to anything else. And, and to Wheel of Time's credit, it changed that in book two. But I'm just saying, that's why I just counted that in people. Wheelies get mad at me a lot. But uh, this is probably the most Frank Herbert Dunish structured story that I've read since Dune. And that is the ultimate compliment come from me is because that is my favorite book of all time. So I can't give it really a higher higher compliment than that. Uh, just the perfect mix of your action fantasy, your amazing, spectacular, fantastical races, and then a little bit of uh, you know, thought-provoking uh, politics and, uh, and uh, philosophy thrown in there. That's my brand, man. I love it. And if he keeps developing these characters like this, man, uh, I can't wait. Uh, we will be picking up with uh, Dead House Gates in February. Again, if you don't know about the read-along, I'll put the schedule right here for you. Uh, just jump on the Discord. That's where we are doing the reading threads. February 1st through March 31st is going to be our time working on Dead House Gates. So uh, again, if you want to catch up, you can, but the, the conversation in the Discord will be shifted to Dead House Gates on the 1st. So we are in January 2021 right now, no matter when you're watching this. If you want to catch up, you can because the read-along is going through December of 2022. So there's plenty of of time for you guys to catch up. But guys, in the end, uh, I had a blast with this book. I enjoyed it. I liked so many characters that I didn't expect to like. It surprised me in every way, guys. I mean, this is a very, very positive review for a book that people gave me lots of warnings about. And I do think that helped. I think that helped uh, to, to expect to be confused. Yes, yes. if you accept you're going to be confused and just keep going, I think you're going to find a lot to like about this book. I can't wait to see more. So guys, did you read Guardians of the Moon? What did you think? Keep it spoiler free, please, for this video. Hop on those spoiler talks if you want to talk some spoilers because I do still want to get more people to join this read along or just more people to read the Malazan series overall. So uh, thanks for watching, guys, and I will talk to you in the comments.